give you and this organization a uh, hearty thanks. Uh, you guys put me on the map. I say guys neutrally. I know there are women in the room and women involved in this organization. Uh, I'll tell you, I've been through a lot in the last 18 months or so, and I wouldn't have survived it. And the only reason I'm standing here today, at least on the path to uh, continue to be the sheriff of Milwaukee County, is because of this organization and folks like you. You know, I couldn't help from the minute I walked in this room, but actually from the minute I walked in this building. I, I, I can't get my mind off of this, okay? <laughs> Where news happens. Yeah. I thought, really? <laughs> I mean, they actually believe that. <laughs> All right, the mainstream media. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've constantly gone back and forth with certain people in the mainstream media. I believe that the mainstream media in the United States has abandoned their responsibility to the people of this country. And they've gone from being, or at least the intent of uh, being a watchdog for the people, a watchdog of government, and they've turned themselves into a wholly owned subsidiary and propaganda wing of the left. And uh, I find that quite remarkable, I really do, especially when we talk about this document. We've heard a lot about this document this morning. All right, the last time I addressed this group was in St. Charles, Missouri. I talked about this document. I talk about it incessantly. I am not a constitutional scholar. I don't need to be. All right, the people involved in the drafting of this document were not constitutional scholars, didn't know what a constitution was yet. <laughs> Wrote it in pretty simple language. And then over decades and over a couple of centuries, this thing has been turned into some very difficult and theoretical document because of courts, because of lawyers. All right, but the original meaning of this is pretty understandable. I tell people that I carry a copy of this everywhere I go. I keep one in my vehicle, so I have it handy. I keep one at work, obviously, I keep several in my home, and I keep one in my travel bag. So in case I get on a plane and go somewhere, guess what, I have this document. Chris Ann talked a little bit about this, about knowing what it is. I don't have to memorize this document. When she asked the five elements of the First Amendment, she said, don't answer it, you know, what are they? I don't know that I could have named all five, but guess what I did? I picked this up and went, let me take a look. <laughs> no, that's why I carry this thing. And she hit the nail right on the head. If you don't know what this says, if you don't know what your rights are, how do you know if you still have them? Okay, it's that important on Constitution Day, and on every day of a calendar year. Because this, is, to me, is all that matters. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter to me. All right, that's the ruling class. Conservative, liberal, maybe sometimes. Some of the discussions that we have. So people ask me, well, Sheriff, then what's important? I go, this. This is why I exist. And when I start to lose my understanding of what I've been elected by the people of Milwaukee County to do, and it's to enforce this and to protect their rights, and they don't need me anymore. And we heard about the Declaration of Independence. My copy of this one has both the Declaration and the Constitution, so I find it handy. And we heard a little bit about the Declaration of Independence this morning. And several people talked about the, the first part, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. But I want to read quickly the part that comes after that. Because I think that that is what's at stake and what's in, at play today, as we talk about how the Constitution is being trampled. All right, we don't rule ourselves anymore. We're ruled by the courts. And I tell people, don't trust the courts. All right, they get it wrong sometimes. Don't forget the Supreme Court of the United States in the Dred Scott decision continued the institution of slavery. The United States Supreme Court. 
the United States Supreme Court in the decision Plessy versus Ferguson upheld the constitutionality of separate but equal. The Supreme Court of the United States. That's why I say don't trust the courts. All right, and I think we're ruled by the courts. I really do. But anyway, it says this. After the, the sentence that ends the pursuit of happiness, that to, I'm sorry, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. And that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. This doc do document, the Declaration of Independence, says it is your duty to abolish that government. When I uttered these words about two years ago, boy, did the left come down on me. He's calling for revolution. I said, I'm not calling for ever anything these guys did. <laughs> and I reminded them, I said, I took these words right out of the Declaration of Independence. Read your Declaration of Independence and read your Constitution. It doesn't take that long to read these documents. We don't teach our kids this stuff anymore either. But that's part of what's at play here, because the first step toward enslaving people the first step is separate them from their history. <clears throat> you separate people from their history, you can lead them anywhere. And history is full of despots that have actually done that very thing. And that's what's happening today in our schools. We don't teach history anymore. We don't teach this stuff. So if the generations growing up don't know where we came from, like you and I learned, then that's when this stuff will go away. Because they're the next generation of elected officials and judges and other people who are going to make the determining, uh, who are going to make the determinations of how we're going to organize ourselves as a society. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about the election that I just went through. Uh, many of you in here are elected, you go through this in your county every four years, at least in my state, every four years. And, uh, for me, it's always an uphill battle because of uh, my adherence to this document, I'm a constitutional sheriff. I embrace the oath that I took. A lot of people take this oath. And I raised my right hand. I had my left on the Bible. And I said, I will defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I damn well meant it. You've heard me say that before. Now, to many people that take that oath, and I don't mean my, my colleagues in law enforcement, but I'm talking about in our legislature, those are just words on paper. That's all it is. And they never come back to them again in their time of service. All right, so when I talked about the role of the media, and, and I, let's just get rid of this word and put where entertainment happens. <laughs> because news, has morphed into entertainment. That's really all it is. So the Journal Sentinel, the major newspaper in my county, uh, we go toe to toe. And there are several people said to me, Clark, don't take on the newspaper. Don't argue with people who buy their ink by the barrel. Okay? But uh, that doesn't scare me. All right, so I took them on. And they actually wrote an editorial in that newspaper and they said, we ignore Clark. We don't pay attention to him anymore. And I said, really? I started thinking about their role under this. I said, I happen to be in our representative government, our representative democracy. I happen to be a representative and elected, duly elected by the people of this county. In many aspects, I'm their voice. It's how we do this in a representative democracy. How can you ignore the million people that live in Milwaukee County who, and not all one million, obviously, but who elected me to be in this role. I'm their voice. What do you mean you, you ignore me? You can't do it. At least you shouldn't do it. They can do what they want. But that's why I said this here, and they've abdicated their responsibility. 
That's what I mean by that. So my election was unprecedented. It's a primary race for sheriff. And you had three major party third interest groups, the fourth being the local media. But you had the Greater Wisconsin Committee, which is a third party uh, attack group, liberal, by the way. You had the county executive, a millionaire himself, who dumped 260 million, I'm sorry, 260,000 of his own money to defeat me. He was that motivated. And then in parachutes, Michael Bloomberg. Final days of the campaign, with 150,000 of his own dollars, and he ran three straight days before the campaign of nonstop ads, painting me and depicting me as some gun nut hell bent on arming everybody in America and telling them, don't call the police anymore. All right, none of which could be further from the truth. However, Michael Bloomberg made one fatal error. He didn't take the temperature on the ground before parachuting in. And he didn't realize. It. And he said to one political uh, observer as to why he was dumping 150,000 of his own money into this, he said, this one's personal with me. All right, a local sheriff's primary. So the last estimate had about $800,000 of, of third party money, not the individual con uh, contributions, okay? I only raised about 150,000 of my own money. My opponent, who was just some hand-picked puppet, puppet to uh, do the bidding of the left, uh, he raised about 60,000. So there was $800,000 in attack ads against me that came in two weeks before the campaign. All right, it was a surreal experience. I'm talking 24 hours on the TV. All right, I don't watch that much TV anyway. It doesn't bother me, but you know, my wife, my family, my in-laws were in town. They had to sit up there and watch this. Okay, but that's part of it. I, you know, I could deal with it, but it's, it's hard on them. Okay, but the other thing, that, the other mistake they made, I run a populist campaign. I appeal to individual citizens on a day-to-day -day basis, grassroots. I meet people, I talk to people, I go everywhere I'm invited, where I can. And I just talk to people like I'm talking to you today. And I called on friends and I called on organizations like CSPOA. I had a conversation with Sheriff Mack during that time. I had a conversation with uh, Larry Pratt, and he got the Gun Owners um, of America chapter in Wisconsin involved. I called on my friends. And I said, I'm under attack. I'm getting shelled and I need your help. And I called on other organizations like the NRA. And I realized some of these are rival groups. I don't get involved in the politics of that stuff. I needed help from anywhere I could find it. And I remember Chris Cox, the director of the NRA's uh, Institute for Legislative Action, I think. And he said to me in a conversation, he called me back. Right, local county sheriff, right? What, why the heck would he? He said, Sheriff, we don't leave our friends behind. We're going to help. Okay, that's why I survived that primary. All right, so I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody. I think the, I've already thanked the voters in Milwaukee County. I didn't win this thing. They lifted me up on their shoulders, and they carried me to victory. That's how I got that done. The last thing I want to talk about, and, and I wasn't scheduled to talk about this. This is important. Someone mentioned Eric Holder. And I'll be, I'm known for uh, not sugarcoating things. <laughs> this pissed me off. <laughs> I sat up and watched as events unfold in Ferguson, Missouri. Unfortunate situation, obviously. Uh, anytime a law enforcement officer uses force and takes a life, it deserves a thorough, transparent vetting, an investigation. We all kind of agree with that. But then some groups started to converge on the small town of Ferguson, Missouri, like vultures on a roadside carcass. Groups like the New Black Panther Party, people like Al Sharpton, to come and exploit that situation. And instead of coming in to help and try to restore calm, poured gas on that fire with some of their inflammatory 
and irresponsible rhetoric. And I sat up there and listened to Governor Nixon. And I sat up there and listened to Claire McCaskill, the senator. And then I sat up there and listened to Eric Holder throw law enforcement officers under the bus for political expediency. These are the same individuals at election time that come around wanting support from law enforcement organizations, right? They all stand up there. I'm supported by the, this fraternal organization and this police association, and I've received a, a excellent rating by the... They do that when they need us. But now there was an opportunity to improve their bona fides with some of these interest groups like the New Black Panther Party to flaunt their racial sensitivity and threw law enforcement under the bus. I expect that from Governor Nixon. I expected that from Claire McCaskill. Those are nothing but two-bit politicians. They do that sort of, that's what politicians do, you know that. But I did not expect that from Eric Holder, who calls himself a law enforcement officer. And instead of talking responsibly, instead of measuring his words, because that's what's needed at a time like that, you gotta measure what you say, because tensions are high, and the wrong thing said can make a <laughs> bad situation worse. And he sat up there and talked about how he has seen law enforcement officers profile. He's been the victim of racial profiling himself, and he named two situations. One in, in a traffic stop in, in New Jersey, and he said, I remember feeling the indignation as they searched my vehicle. And then he talked about a situation when he was in Georgetown, not too far from here, and how he and a friend were stopped on the way to the movie theater, and they felt that they were racially profiled. And he said, I was a federal prosecutor when those things happened. And I said, wait a minute. Mr. Attorney General, if you felt those officers had violated your Fourth Amendment rights and you're a federal prosecutor and you didn't say anything at the time, on behalf of everybody in the United States, you could have done something if you felt that. You could have made a complaint. Because all of us kind of realize in law enforcement, right, we testify, what do they say in court? If you didn't write it down, you didn't report it, it didn't happen. And that's what I was thinking. Oh, really, Mr. Attorney General? You didn't report it then. You didn't write it down. But you're telling us some 10, 15 years later for self-serving purposes. I thought, why did you do that? You insulted every law enforcement officer, every man and woman that puts on that badge and uniform every day, risks their lives in service to their community. And I thought, how could you do that? Who cares about what happened to you? What about the people of Ferguson, Missouri right now? Who cares about you, Eric Holder? But he did that for self-serving purposes. So I felt he owed an apology to every man, not to me. I'm a big boy, I have big shoulders. But to every person that serves in your agencies, who puts on that uniform and goes out, and this man sat up there and, and kind of insinuated that these law enforcement officers go out with some nefarious or malicious intent in their heart to deny people their rights and to indiscriminately shoot and take people's lives for nothing. And I was incensed by that. And that's why I said something publicly. And of course he didn't apologize. And of course he won't apologize. I don't expect him to, but I called him on it. Because that's the same guy who shows up at the law enforcement memorial here in, in May in Washington, D.C. I've heard him speak. Was that the one two days ago as the name of one of my officers was placed on the wall? And he sits up there talking about the courage and commitment of our law enforcement officers across the country. And they serve with dignity and all that stuff. And I thought, you SOB. You didn't talk about the racial profiling then. Why are you bringing this up now? That's why I said something. So the reason why I brought this up today, remember that the next time this guy comes to your town. All right, because he's on a mission with these investigation of law enforcement agencies anyway. I think by now they're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Just got done with Seattle, and putting these people under the consent decrees and basically identifying them as racist institutions and, and racist cops, so on and so forth. So keep that in mind, okay, when he comes to visit your town and talk to your law enforcement officers or whatever. And when, you, when he does, go up and ask him. Have you offered that apology yet, Mr. Attorney General, the one that Sheriff Clark 
ask you about. Just watch his reaction, okay? Thanks again. <laughs> Great to see all of you. And God bless you. This is former Sheriff Richard Mack. Thank you so much for watching these timely speakers documenting solutions for modern day heroes. This movement cannot be successful without the support of the American people. That's where you come in. These conference videos prove that the work we are doing is absolutely making a difference. It is the solution. Donate today at CSPOA.org. Become a member of the CSPOA and strengthen our voice and stand with us for peace and liberty.